halfway when I remember the pillow and I didn't want to go back and get it. All right. Glory. Again. You want to see blessing? Thank you so much that moment. See these two here? Those are both my grandsons. That's a blessing, huh? They got that. Big and little. We had a little split there. I love it. And they're here. Everybody that's here, I'm glad you're here. Nobody's here by accident. Somebody came because somebody said, well, no, I might get a bed of groceries, or maybe some of the guys from the center said, well, at least we can get out of here for a while, and we can go hang out in this place, and but that might be your play. But the Lord has another plan for you. We've had people come in here before with the wrong intentions, and they absolutely confronted by the Spirit of the living God, and have their lives changed. It's amazing. And so today I pray that's what's going to happen here for anybody who just wandered in. I want to speak to you today from the greatest sermon probably ever preached was preached by Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And you find it in Matthew chapter 5, it's what we know as the Beatitudes. But there's some things about the Beatitudes that we don't really understand. And we need to understand a few things here that... Uh, it's important to know who he's talking to at his time, and uh, some of the some of the the words obviously so plain. But I just want you to understand. I was reading this this week, and I felt like Monday or Sunday last week, and I felt that's one the Holy Spirit put on my heart to to bring this to you today. So Holy Spirit, we don't know what you're going to do with me today, and I just pray that you use this unworthy vessel to speak. And I, I just pray as the Word tells us. Your know, Word does not come back void. So I pray that you'll strike and accomplish that which you send it out to accomplish. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to take my time with this. You can do this for a couple weeks. Who knows? I have no idea what I'm doing. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. I, when Jesus saw the crowd, he went up on the mountain. Now I've read that a thousand times. But there's something interesting this time, the word mountain kind of jumped out at me. Because we see in the Old Testament that Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from Yahweh on Mount Sinai. We also see Jesus went up on the mountain to be transfigured when he went up there with James and Peter, James, and John, and he had an encounter, and there was Moses and Elijah. And then, of course, Mount Zion someday. There's something about that going up on the mountain. I just saw that. I thought, wow, that's kind, of, that's kind of cool. Because this Jesus was not just any man. There were a lot of prophets who came in those days. A lot of them. A lot of false prophets. And here comes the prophet. Here comes the son of the living God himself. And he goes up on the mountain. I think that's awesome. Remember something as I begin to give you these Beatitudes. He is speaking to the Jewish people who were now under the control of the Roman Empire. The Romans had overtaken Israel. And these were basically slaves. They let them live, but they had to pay taxes. They had to give all of their produce to the Romans first to make sure their soldiers ate. If they didn't like the way you look, they crucified you. If they didn't like your attitude, they crucified you. You were nothing to them. Nothing. 
They run you over in the streets and not even bat an eye. And this is who Jesus came for. So the Jewish people believed when they saw the Old Testament scriptures that Messiah was coming, they thought Messiah was coming as a king to defeat the Romans. They did not understand that he came as a king to defeat our sin, to, to, to defeat Satan. Satan was a bigger foe than the Romans ever were. And so that, I just wanted to lay that little foundation before I tell you these Beatitudes and and they're really not just attitudes. Some people said that this should be our attitudes. But it's really more than that. This should be... This should be the tendency of our lives. Blessed or to be favored. God favored. You are favored or blessed by the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Amen. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So he's saying this, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So here he's telling these people, when you're going through these things, you're blessed. Not you're just not blessed because you're going through them. You're blessed because you 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 go through it trusting in Yahweh. Amen. You're trusting in Him. No matter what the world brings at you, it doesn't make any difference. You know who you love. You know who, who created you. Remember last week we talked about the King, which the very first scripture in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We need to understand that. We need to know that. That needs to be the, flat, the foundation of our lives. So that if that's the foundation of my life, whatever comes my way, I'll stand on the rock that is Christ. I'm standing on the rock. So when you are persecuted, you're blessed. When you're poor in spirit, when you're downhearted, He'll be there for you. Call out to Him. He did not put us here to be alone. I'm never alone. I'm never alone. Even when you feel like you're alone, it, when you are His, when you are saved, you're never alone. Yesterday, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Jesus Christ has said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, don't be afraid. I will always be with you. Well, how? Because the Holy Spirit is in us. If you're a believer, He's with you. <coughs> I read of stories of Richard Wormbrand and some of these people who've been in prison for years, literally for years. It's this Richard Wormbrand, he was a minister of the gospel in Czechoslovakia, I think. But the communists took him over and they arrested him because of his faith and he was speaking out. They put him in a prison where they separated from his wife and children. He didn't know if they were alive or dead. They didn't know if he was alive or dead. And they beat him every day for, I don't know how many years, 10 or 15 years. And I mean, and they kept beating him and he kept praying. And this one guard in particular, he hated this guy. And like, he'd come by and he'd pull the little slot to his door and he'd find the guy praying. And if he found him praying, he'd go in there and put his feet in shackles and he'd beat the bottom of his feet with a stick. Beat him all the time. It would have been easy for this guy to pray that God would kill that man. So after years of abuse, he came again. And he just took a beat in the day before, and sure enough, here he comes, he opens the door, and he says, pray it again. He opens the door, he goes in, he's going to start beating, and says, what is wrong with you? Why do you keep praying? Don't you see what you get when you pray? And what do you got to pray for anyway? And Wormbrand looks up to the as much as he can even speak, he said, I'm praying for you. <laughs> the guy didn't hit him again. <laughs> he didn't know what to do about that. In the face of persecution, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to love and not hate. 
And it's difficult if you're running the show. When you're in charge, it's difficult not to hate people when they're unkind to you, or they don't think like you think. But when you surrender all, like we say, and, and you allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in your life. When I, when I became a believer, I said, Lord, come into my life and make any changes you see necessary. If there's anything in my life, I still pray. If there's anything in my life you don't like, if there's any way I offend you, remove it from me. Make me the person you want me to be, not that I want to be. And he'll do that. So this is what he's saying. Blessed are those who mourn, because I'm with you. Blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. Why? Because I'm with you. And I love the blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the Lord. They will see God. They will see Yahweh. Children are pure in heart. <coughs> That people say, no, what about a child? When a child dies, what about them? You know, they have them baptized. Oh, come on, man. Those precious little angels go right to heaven if that happens. Pure in heart. They don't hate anybody. I remember doing a funeral for a little five-year-old precious little boy named Angel. That wasn't his real name, but that's what everybody called him. When he was a baby, he got uh, spinal meningitis and it just destroyed his mental abilities, but yet he was just so precious. I mean, he loved everybody. Loved everybody. He didn't care what color you were. He didn't care when you went to school. He didn't care what you thought about anything. If you came to talk to angels, he'd light up and smile at you. And I told the people when I gave that the, his funeral, I said, we have seen a beautiful picture of Jesus in this little boy. Because Jesus could look at the most wretched of sinners and love them. He could look at the people who were mocking him up on the cross with blood pouring out of his hands, blood pouring down his face, back all torn from the whip that he endured, legs all scarred up from falling in the whip, falling under the weight of the cross, beaten, spit at, mocked, and here he is on the cross, and what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is what he's saying here. To be a follower of Jesus means that we have surrendered to him and that his spirit comes to live in our lives and we relinquish control. It's like you give him the keys to the car. You give him the keys to your life. It's not about you anymore. We're all going to go through things. Everybody in this room, you're going to go through, I promise you. Sicknesses will come. Death in the family is going to come. It's going to come for all of us. Would you rather go through that kind of tragedy with or without Him? <laughs> That's the question. The choice is yours. Let me tell you something else. Heaven or hell, the choice is yours. You can choose hell by rejecting Jesus. There's nobody going to be in hell that doesn't deserve to be there. And quite frankly, there's not going to be anybody in heaven except for God and, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Himself that really deserves to be there by their own deserts. But we will be in heaven because we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus and we're saved. Not by our own merits will we be saved, but by the grace of our Lord. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt. Salt adds flavor, it also preserves things. We are supposed to add flavor to this world. We are also... To, to be part of this world. And if we've lost our saltiness, if we lost our ability to make a difference in this world, what good are we? We've got churches out there. We don't tell anybody about Jesus. We don't tell anybody about anything. We, you know what? When we leave church on Sunday, we're just like everybody else out there. Frankly, that to me is not a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus is a follower of Jesus when people are looking and when people aren't looking. Because we don't care what people think. We care what he thinks. 
And that's the truth. Stop and think. What do you think? Are you worried about what everybody thinks about you? You know, the Lord sometimes used to put me through some of these terrible, I thought, terrible experiences where he'd ask me to do unusual things and I would be embarrassed. I yesterday I told a story when Peggy and I lived in Iowa City. We were, uh, one night, I don't know, I uh, went to church with her cousins uh, in Cedar Rapids. They had a nice church up there, I think it was called Antioch Christian Church. Peggy didn't go, the girls were home, I can't remember why, but I was there. And at the beginning of the service, and I'm pretty much a new believer, I think I've been saved for two years. And I was in the back of the church with Peggy's cousins, and they wheeled in this kid. That was the most handicapped person I'd ever seen in my life. He was probably 15, 16 years old. He was really on a wheel. He wasn't even in a wheelchair. It was like a wheel bed. And he was just all twisted up. And there I am, sitting back there. And I looked at him, and it, it broke my heart. And then I, I'll tell you, in my spirit, I heard the Holy Spirit say, go over there and put your hand on that boy. And he'll get out. I swear to you. Go over there and put your hand on that boy and he'll get up. And I thought, what? What would they, what would they people think about? What, what if I walked over and nothing happened? What if they me, 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 me? We're all a bunch of glee club people. Me, 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 me. <laughs> and then he said it again. Go over there and put your hand on that boy. And I didn't hear him here. I heard him here. And he'll get up. And cement just filled my feet. I couldn't move. And I didn't move. And that was before the service even began. So then I got to sit there in that service. I, I didn't hear a thing anybody said. All I could think was, I disobeyed the Lord. And I drove home from Cedar Rapids. I don't know if I told you about that, honey, or not. But I cried all the way home. Because I disobeyed the Lord. And I said, Lord... Send somebody who obeys you. Don't let my disobedience keep that boy from getting the healing that he was supposed to get. And I said, I'll never do that again. Give me a chance. So, we come back to Omaha, and sure enough, there I am, in a store one day, and all the Spirit puts on my heart, go in and pray for that person. I'm saying, no, no. I said, that's the devil. That was the devil. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, oh, 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 what, 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 what? No, okay, okay. So I'd walk up to these strangers. And it went on for a couple of years. I'd walk up to them and I'd say, excuse me, I don't know you. But God, please pray for you. And every single time, they put their hands up, two hands, they put them up for me to pray for them. That's absolutely amazing. There were times when I prayed for them and it was exactly what they'd been praying for. They needed to hear from the Lord. There was a woman one time in our thrift store who I caught out of the corner of my eye. She was leaving the store and I thought, oh, I would have been the Holy Spirit. said, go speak to that woman. Talk about how God works. I go outside. We're really, really busy. And she's gone. I can't find her anywhere. And here's some of these, three of these, one of my favorite customers driving up. Her car's all over the place. These ladies come up from North Omaha. I know, I know they love the Lord. They say, She's in the black car. I said, what? What did you say? They said, she's in the black car. I said, who's in the black car? That woman you're looking for. I thought, wow. So I walk up to the woman, sure enough, she's in the black car. I knock on the door. And I said, excuse me, I'm supposed to tell you this. And I can't remember what I told her because that was not my business. But it was something about what she'd been praying about. And that woman just sat there and sobbed. Because she had, it was an answer to her prayer. That she'd been praying these things and finally the Lord heard her prayer. We need to be people that are salt in this world. If we live for ourselves, your saltiness is good for nothing. Everybody lives for themselves. Salt is different than sugar. Salt preserves. Salt adds <coughs> flavor. So we need to be these type of people that make a difference in our community. You need to be the type of people that make a difference in your families. He said, you are the light of the world. A city hid on a hill cannot be hidden. 
nor one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel, but puts it on a lampstand and it can stand and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We should live as followers of Christ. If you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, Yahweh is my king, then your light should shine. You should shine. You ought not to be speaking like the world. You shouldn't talk like them. You shouldn't be enjoying the things of the world because things that, are, things that God would not enjoy, why, should we, why would we enjoy them? Why would I like anything he doesn't like? I should be angry about what he's angry about, and I should be thankful and pleased about what he's pleased about. If truly, his spirit lives inside of me. We need Christians out here who walk in the light, who bring light into dark situations. And everybody that you know in this world that doesn't know Jesus, they're in the dark. And they need someone to come to them and bring them the light. One thing I'll tell you, I've never seen... When I flipped on a switch in a dark room, I never saw a battle between light and darkness. Oh, oh yeah? No. Light, bam, darkness leaves. Light overrules the darkness. And yet we walk, we go to church, and then we live in darkness. Or we go to church and we hide our light. I don't want anybody to see it. Don't anybody see it. How many opportunities have you had where the Lord might have put something on your heart and you didn't do it? How many times has he led you to speak to somebody and you didn't obey him? The good news is he'll forgive you. But the bad news is, I believe God blesses those who are faithful. The word tells us when you're faithful over a few things, he'll give you more to do. So when you prove that, yes, I will do what you tell me to do, he'll ask you more often because he knows. Of course, he knows anything. But when he proved to be faithful, he'll give you things to do. You'll never be bored. I'm never bored. <coughs> I love opportunities to shine as a light. And I don't care if people think I'm weird or not. You think I'm weird or I'm not. I'm safe. There'll be a lot of weird people in heaven. <laughs> if you don't like us now, you won't like us later. <laughs> Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For I tell you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not one stroke of the letter will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not by no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? Because in his day, the religious people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they walked around with the long robes and the phylacteries. And they loved people calling them, oh, hey, hey, Rabbi, hi, Rabbi. And all their righteousness was just outward. When you were looking, when you weren't looking, they were not righteous. Matter of fact, it says in the book of Ezekiel that, that Yahweh gave Ezekiel a vision of the Sanhedrin, the leadership of Israel, at night, doing things that should never have been done when people couldn't see them. Now let me tell you something. You, brothers and sisters, you know there's no place that you can go to hide from the Lord? You know there's no thought? That you can think that he doesn't know. He knows it all. You can say, no, I ain't prejudiced. Oh, yes, you are. No, I don't hate people. You do hate people. Now, hate is something that has to be overcome. That's where light comes in and drives out the darkness. Hate is darkness. <clears throat> the only hate that is acceptable to God is when we hate sin. God hates sin. I hate Satan. He's stupid. Yeah. He really is. I mean, sometimes when you really start walking with him, some of his temptations just make me laugh. <laughs> is that the best you've got? Stupid. When we get to heaven, 
You're going to say, are you kidding me? This is the guy that caused all that trouble. Because he's not any big deal. He's a master liar. He's a deceiver. He has power. But the only power he has is what you give him. He has no power over a child of God. Zero. People go, oh, 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 scared of the devil. Forget that nonsense. How about the devil be afraid of you? Right. Not you, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll give you just a few more scriptures. Because this is important. Now, when Jesus says these things here, he's saying, you have heard it said. He's talking to Jewish people. He's talking about what you were taught in the law. Okay? So all of these things he's talking to them in those days. I want you to understand that because it's important. You have heard it said in those ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, now when Jesus says, I say to you, he has the authority to say, I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm taking it even further. I'm saying killing someone is bad. I'm saying hating someone is just like killing people to me. That's what he said. He said, I say to you, unless uh, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. But if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you offer your gift at the altar, and you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go be reconciled with people, and then come to quick terms, and then offer your gift. Come to quick terms while your adversary is on the way with him, or your accuser will hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and the guard will throw you into the prison, and you will be there till you pay your last farthing. Listen. There are people in churches all over this country that are unkind to one another, gossips, backbiters, talking behind people's back. That's wrong. It's sin. And it should not be named amongst Christians. Sometimes people come to start telling me something, you know what, I don't want to hear this. How about we, we go get that person and we all talk about it together. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, of course you don't want to do that. <laughs> We've got to stop this business. There are people out there who say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And yet they'll, they'll grind on somebody. They'll find somebody they don't like and they'll run on. God is not pleased with that. He's not pleased with that. Then he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, isn't that something in those days... If you committed adultery, that was a sin. And you would be stoned to death if you were caught in adultery. We wouldn't have no stones to deal with the people if that was the law of the day, would we? No. We'd start to be making stones. <laughs> That's unbelievable. He said, But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. See, he sees the heart. That's what Jesus is looking at. Pornography, it's a wicked sin, brothers and sisters, I guess. It's right out of the pits of hell. If you've got a pornography problem and you have a computer, get rid of your computer. you got a pornography problem, you got a telephone and you're looking at it, get rid of your... The Bible says you better for you to enter heaven with one eye than to enter hell with, with two. It would be better for you to lose something. But Jesus seems to say he's going even further. If your right eye offends you, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away from you. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. But it's better for you to lose one of the members than to lose your whole body into hell. Here's what is important. <coughs> he said, whoever divorces his wife. Now, I've had people say today, you know, well, you know, this person was just divorced. This was a different time. Now, not, God doesn't like divorce. He doesn't. But this scripture, I went back and looked. He was speaking because men had got it in their hearts in those days. For any whim, they just said, oh, I divorce you. Now, that's all I have to do. I divorce you. Give me a certificate. And bye. They could just do that. Jesus said, no. You make a covenant between that woman and Yahweh, you don't just do that. You can't just do that. That's why he said that. 
So he, it's not the same as today. I mean, people, I, sadly, people get divorced in the wrong times as abuse. There's people cheating, and he even says here, in those days, the only way you could divorce is if the woman was unfaithful. We really didn't address the man because that's the way it was in those days. But he's talking about going deeper with the things that Yahweh said in the Ten Commandments and the things that were given in the Deuteronomy and the Levit Leviticus and all these things. He's going deeper. But David heard it said, verse 33, in those ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out your vows you have made to the Lord. He said, You shall not swear falsely, but carry out your vows and names of the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, because it is the throne of Yahweh, or by earth, because it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the great city of the king. Do not swear by your head, for you can't make one hair black or white. Let your yes be your yes, and your no be your no. Anything else comes from the evil one. What is he saying? He's saying we should be, as followers of Jesus, we should be men and women of integrity. And people should be able to count on what you say. You know, when we were kids, we'd say promise, yeah, promise, double promise, extra promise, cross my heart, hope you die, all this nonsense. Right? But you know what? When someone, I know people that if they tell me something, I know it to be true. I also know somebody, a lot of people, that if someone says, oh, they did this, they say, I don't believe that at all. I know them. I know them to be people of character. But that's how we should be as followers of Jesus. We shouldn't be liars. Uh -oh. Are you pinching that, baby? <laughs> she must have a volume button. She's not that loud. I heard some of them get a lot louder. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to share with you today what Jesus is saying here is, is so important for us as followers of Christ to understand that we are to be different. We are to live our lives different. We should be men and women of truth. We should be men and women of forgiveness, of love, of kindness, of mercy. We should not be hateful. This is what it is to be the light in this world. I'm going to finish this chapter just while we're here. You've heard it said, verse 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I say, do not resist the evildoer. Give your coat, give him your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to everyone who asks of you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. So, I think he's speaking there, con considering a lot of things, retaliation, we're not supposed to retaliate, the Bible says vengeance is mine, so if somebody says something bad about you, oh yeah, wow, that's not what we're called to do, let the Lord fight your fights for you, let him do it. I was talking to someone earlier, there was somebody that we know, that I feel that was in ministry, and had gotten very contrary. Everybody that was around this person treated the people very unkindly and with overbearing with, with people. And I tried to talk to this person, but there's no talking to a person who thinks they're always right. So I said, okay, Lord, you deal with them. You deal with them. And you know what he did? He dealt with them. And that person has really humbled themselves lost some things, but they humbled themselves, and now, I feel is much more effective in ministry than that person was before. Sometimes we just don't, you just can't talk to some people, but you don't talk to him. And I didn't pray that prayer to make me right and that person wrong. I prayed that prayer because this person is in front of people, supposing to be a Christian, and that nothing makes me matter than people lying to people, or people out there preaching false teaching, and you got a whole church out there that's being lied to, that breaks my heart. <coughs> pastors, some of these pastors out there live like kings, they expect you to kiss their ring. That is not of God. It's the truth. That's not of God. That breaks my heart. 
I will bow to nobody but the Lord. I respect people. We met uh, the president. This this uh, Biden, when he was the vice president, he was an unusual character even when we met him. He's still an unusual character. And he's out. So, I'm not impressed with people. I'm impressed with God. Everybody puts their pants on just like we do. You know, I met so many movie stars when I was in the hotel business. I met all these people. And I found out something interesting. You know what? They got bathrooms in their rooms just like we do at our house. They take showers. They get dressed with the biggest people. I'm not impressed with them. So how many autographs did you get? Zero. I couldn't care less about their autographs. They're talented. They have a lot of money, but I'm not a parent. You know, we're involved in this here. So what? You've got a lot of money, and I'm supposed to be impressed with that? No. 43. You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what it said. But I say, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and so that you will be the children of your Father who's in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brother and sister, what are what more are you? If you greet only your brother and sister, what more are you doing than anybody else? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Now listen to this last word in chapter five. Be therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. This young man, uh, Hamlin, you guys see that football player last week? The young man had got hit in the heart. You know, I found out this kid loves the Lord. He, he's been helping people in his community. He loves Jesus. He witnesses to his... That's why all these guys are bawling, because this guy's the light on that team. And here he's down, and, you know, I hate to say that it happened to him, but I have to say, I praise God, because everybody in the country that saw that was praying for him. Everybody. I would say it's awesome because he is an outspoken Christian man. He loves the Lord. He makes no bones about it. And he says, hey, whatever happens, happens. It's all up to God, you know. I just, I'm impressed with that. I'm just thankful that when things really happen, we can all come together. But why does it take a tragedy for us all to pray together? Why can't we just say, hey, we all need the Lord. Why don't we start praying together before the tragedy? Why does it take airplanes flying into the World Trade Center to get people to go to church? People, the hour is late. The hour glass <coughs> is turned over and the sands of time are running out. And some of us might not make it through this year. I'm not being prophetic, I'm just saying. Chances are. So my request to the Lord, and my encouragement to you is, Lord, teach you to live each day like it's my very last day on this earth. And my encouragement to you is, you should live each day like the breath you just breathed was your last breath. Because that young man playing football in all his health had no idea that that little tackle it wasn't even a big hit. He just hit him perfect. Just hit him to the right side. That could have been it for him. Well, for him, the story would have gone on. He'd have been looking right in the face of Jesus. We might find a testimony that he did. But I'm saying to you people, we got to start getting this thing right. And the only way you're going to live your life for the Lord is if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. That's the only way you'll ever see the other side of heaven. And we can all see here, but we'll never see the third heaven unless you have lost in the middle of the land. So I encourage you, if there's anyone in this room today that says, you know what, I've been living my life contrary to the way of God. I've been living a hateful life, I'm unkind, I'm selfish, I'm broken, I'm hateful, I'm, I need help. 
You can say, I'm the worst person I know. You know what? God can change you. God can take the hardest heart and change it. Amen. So I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many people you lied to, how many people you stole from, how many people you injured, you shot, you cheated on. God can forgive you. Because His power knows no limits. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if there's anyone in this room that says, I want to give my life to Jesus today, right where you're at, I'd like you to have the courage to stand up and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to live not according to my laws, or the laws even of this land. I want to live according to what Jesus says I should live. I want to be a follower of Christ. I'm going to ask Him for forgiveness. I've done terrible things, but I know the Bible says, if you come to me, I will take your sin, and I will cast it as far as the east is from the west, and I will not remember it anymore. And I promise you that to be a fact. You'll not be the same anymore. Your life will be transformed. And if you would surrender all, like the song we said, Lord, from this day forward, I, I relinquish control. I'm going to tell you this story before I pray for you. A long time ago, this young minister came to this wonderful man of God, and he said, listen, uh, I've got an amazing radio ministry. We've got people coming. Our church is growing like crazy. He said, but I've heard you've had an experience with the Holy Spirit, and I want you to pray for me so I can have what you've got. So this man of God said it reminded him a lot about of himself, that he was a younger person. And he said, well, if you really want to, if you really want the Lord in your life, he says, what you've got to do is, he said, you need to slide over and let Jesus drive your car. And then he stopped and said, no, nah, that's not going to be good enough. Because he knows that old rascal because he knew himself. He said, as soon as he started going in a direction he didn't want to, you'd reach over and grab the wheel and you start helping him to turn. So he said, that's not going to work. So he said, if you really want to follow Jesus, and this is what I'm saying to you, if you really want to give your life to Christ, he said, you need to get out of the car, go around to the back of the car, open up the trunk, get into the trunk, give the keys to the Lord Jesus Christ, shut the door and say, Lord, drive anywhere you want to, wherever you want to go, I'm with you. That's what you have to do. Right? So just reach up your hands to heaven. You guys that are in this room, everybody who's stood up, I thank God that you're here. And pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Yahweh my God, forgive me of my sins. I broke your heart. I broke the law. And it was because of me that Jesus had to die. Forgive me. As best as I know how, I give you my life. Body, soul, and spirit. That from this day forward, my life is no longer my own. My life belongs to you. Your name is on the title owner of me. And I will go where you call me to go. And I will do what you tell me to do. And I'll say what you tell me to say. I'm yours. I renounce Satan in the ways of this world. Come Holy Spirit. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Look at your